this computer. So hold on a second here. Let me go back here. Uh, Pete, you're up. I, I'll uh, I'll start. I'll go back here so, you, so we can get to you. And I'll just let me know when you're ready, and I'll go back to the presentation. All right, wonderful. All right, so and I'll talk a little bit first before we jump into the presentation. And um, and how how long did you, did you anticipate this meeting? I wasn't. Is it an hour? Um, we've got it down for an hour, but uh, honestly, okay. take it you know take as long as you want. It's I will be. By the way, I don't think a listing appointment should be that long, and so you guys will have some extra time. We're going to be efficient, just as I am in my listing and presentation. So as as long as we have a little bit of extra time. What I'd like to just first uh, key into is what I did on the um, one of the a couple of weeks ago, the uh, office meeting, and I refresh my numbers, and I always say that in a listing presentation, use the numbers strategically. It's really important to know the numbers. It's important to know inventory, and use those to your advantage. So, um, the last time I reported on the numbers we were in a little bit of a tailspin and while the number of sales were improving the price per square foot had been de decreasing and at that point i always say pre-covid stay-at-home orders and post um, on the post we were down six percent on a price per square foot basis we have come roaring back in this marketplace in hancock park and the surrounding areas and we're flat on a price per square foot basis now. And so the market has really reacted. I just came back from 520 Lillian Way in our backyard and they priced it at 17 for a 1500 square foot house and they already have multiple offers on it and they're looking at offers on Friday. And I think you were probably all experiencing tons of multiple offers. Um, so anyway, flat on a price per square foot basis in July, we're down 9% uh, on the number of houses sold this year to last year. So really, we were down in uh, May, we were down 58% on the number of houses sold for the month of May this year to last year. So you can see there's some huge momentum. We're probably all experiencing it. Multiple offers all over the place. If something's priced right, it's gone in 30 seconds. Of course, uh, the consumer, uh, the buyers are really sophisticated. They have all the information at their fingertips that we have, um, but it's up to us to speak confidently about the numbers because we see and hear everything. Um, and so, so that's, any questions on those numbers before I dive into the uh, listing presentation? Are they specific, Pete, just to Hancock Park? Yeah, so so um, so that to get a big enough sampling, I used Hancock Park, Miracle Mile, uh, Los Feliz, Silver Lake, um, Hollywood Hills East. So all of the all those neighborhoods are kind of like for like in terms of their price points, and I just needed a big enough sampling of the surrounding areas. I'd love to do it just for Hancock Park, uh, but it's not a it's there's not enough. Uh, houses that are, are transacting to have it be uh, big enough to be accurate enough. And you get a $10 million property that would just skew all the results. Um, all right, so any other questions on that? Okay, so let's dive into uh, to the uh, listing presentation. And um, before we get into my actual package, uh, I always do a two-pronged approach and Star and I just uh, w went in on a listing and we, we did the, that exact thing we did. I like to go to the property. I like to um, see the property, see what the upgrades are, find out from the owners what the systems are and all the upgrades that they did over the years. If there are any issues that I need to know about, um, I like, I actually insist on doing that. I will not go on a listing presentation with my presentation cold. I just won't do it. And if people say I don't have enough time, then, then I don't have enough time for them because I need to take control of the situation. And that's one of the ways I take control. And so never will I wing it 
And I, I frankly think that if I'm going up against agents who are doing that, I've got the, I've got the one up on them because I've suggested that it's important enough to me in my busy schedule to go and, and visit the property twice. It's not, it's not necessarily as good a use of my time as, is, you know, when I'm busy that I, I have the time, but that's how important I think it is. During that meeting, I really listen, take notes, and I really want to hear from the sellers, ideally, what they think their house is worth. Um, and I can get so much information during that time. I want to know also, um, more, most importantly, what they think the house is worth. And I'll never volunteer what I think the house is worth during that first presentation, but they almost always volunteer. And I'll pry them if they're being stubborn about it, but what they think the house is worth. And um, that gives me the tools to go back to my office to really hone in and strategically create my formal presentation for when I go back to them. And, uh, and I also wanna know who my competition is. Um, am I going up against in Hancock Park, uh, the best agents in Hancock Park? Am I going up against agents that aren't from the area? And I will really hone in my formal presentation to speak to my qualifications as they relate to uh, the competition, if I have competition. Um, so I'll stop there and, and uh, see if you have questions regarding that. You let them know up front that you're going to be visiting the property twice? Yes, yes. And I always say to them, the first presentation, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, the first walkthrough is just an informal meet and greet. Don't clean up your house for me. Uh, I'm just going to whip through, uh, ask you a couple of questions, and I'll be on my way. And oftentimes, we set up the formal presentation for a day or two later. Uh, where I'll, uh, I won't, I won't lose momentum. I'll, I'll, you know, try to keep the flow going. Um, but I also, if I'm, if they're meeting with other agents, I love to go last. And I love to go up against them. They've already met with the other agents. And depending on who, again, who those other agents are, I'll fine tune my uh, formal presentation, especially my marketing commitment when we get into that, um, on what bells and whistles I'm going to put into that presentation versus if I'm going up against, uh, let's say for argument's sake, Lisa Hutchins, I know Lisa Hutchins isn't spending any money on marketing. She's not doing anything other than getting photography that she probably even takes herself or her assistant takes. And I'm going to bring in my professional photographer and I'm going to do some bells and whistles, but I know most of the bells and whistles I'm going to do and, and pick from are for my benefit to market myself as it relates to the property, not to get the listing. And how much time do you spend on the second appointment? Second appointment, uh, I like to keep it really efficient. My, my business acumen is really all business, not warm and friendly. Of course, if I'm with friends or, or people that I know well, it'll be a little less uh, structured and a little less stiff, but I'm kind of business-like, right to the point, boom, boom, boom. And I can do it as quickly as a half hour. I don't want to be any more than 45 minutes. I, I hear listing appointments for two hours. I can't even fathom what I could do in two hours other than shoot the breeze and have a drink and schmooze. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, I really uh, try to disengage from that type of listing appointment. So. Thanks. Um, do you, do you have, ever find people who don't want to tell you who your competition is, what other brokers they're going to talk to? Uh, yeah, yeah, I actually, it's funny you say that, Tim, because I just, uh, I just turned down a listing or a listing presentation because he was such, I have to say, he was such an ass to me on the phone when I asked him uh, about that, who, he, who else he was going to be meeting with. And he said to me, that's none of your business. And I said, well, you know, I, I just, um, 
I, I like to know who the competition is. I like to know if I'm going up against local agents or Beverly Hills agents. And, and he shut me down and he was so rude that I knew I would never connect with him. And, um, and so the next, the, the, that night I, I wrote an email to him saying that I, I thanked him for the opportunity, but, um, but I probably wasn't a good fit for him. Um, almost always they, they say it or, you know, sometimes they'll say, oh, I'm just meeting with a, a, another local agent or so, lots of times they say, uh, you were referred, you're the only person I'm meeting with. So um, it just, it just depends. So, you know, I've had maybe a, a handful of times with, when they were reluctant, but then when I got to them in person, I was able to um, cry it out of them. Yeah, Quinn. Oh, I can't hear you. You're, you're muted. I wanted to ask you if they don't allow two appointments to come and let, let you come in twice, you just shoot the, they're just trying to get a price out of you. You know, you can tell then you just say goodbye. Uh, Clint, my approach is that it, it has to be a two, it has to be a two appointment uh, process. And, and by the way, I, I play the tough guy. I'm not the tough guy. I'm very, very warm and friendly with people and, and, um, and very diplomatic. And so I'll emphasize that, look, I think it's, I think it's so important for me to come in and see your property and see what you've done to it, what the upgrades are. Um, and if they say that, that they can tell me over the phone, um, I just will say it, it, it goes beyond that. And I need to get in to see the property. I'll be as quick as I can. Oh, uh, but I've got the kids sleeping and this and that. Okay, I don't have to go into the kids' bedroom. We can skirt that. I can get an idea of, of the size of the bedroom by just walking around the perimeter. Uh, I, just, I, I just think it's so important that, um, and again, I'm taking a leadership role in the process too. And I think that if, if I'm going to be their listing agent, I need to be able to have some control over the process. If they're right out of the gate saying, no, you're not coming over or no, you know, it's, I'm sorry, it's probably, it's probably not in a good fit for me. All right, so, um, so let's jump into, the, into my presentation. Um, my presentation, okay, so I, all right, I see what you're doing there. Is that right? So, you know, I have, I'm going to go quickly through some of this. This is, this is my own branding. Um, and I, I do a presentation booklet. Um, I have a presentation this afternoon at three o'clock. It's something like this presentation and uh, we're going to do it. Now I've gone and seen the property, but I um, am not going to do the formal presentation in person. I'm going to, do a Zoom call with him for the formal presentation. Uh, but I've sent this all to him now, so he's gonna have read through it. Um, and this is a house down on the beach in Santa Monica. Uh, and um, this guy spent a lot of money to buy the house and now he just wants to dump it. So I'll be really efficient this afternoon with him. He's seen all this, so we're not gonna go through all this. But um, the first thing I, I do is talk about, uh, go, to, go back to that. Uh, other page add if you would please so this is my uh, profile I say to them take a look at the profile this isn't about me this is about you and your house but I'll quickly point out to you that you know I do a lot of business in the area top 1% of agents throughout the country I pull in anything that I can at the given time that's pertinent to me um, th uh, thankfully I just uh, got an award the other day with Keller Williams and so I'll point out uh, my top producing of Keller Williams in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I'll talk about quickly my business background prior to uh, real estate, but that's become less and less important as I've been in this business 20 years. And it's really more about what my, what my qualifications are now as a real estate agent. But early on in my career, I, I really brought in more my professional background and what I had accomplished in my former career in retail. And I would, I would plan that. So anything 
that you do that you think is beneficial to enhance your position in getting the listing is important for you to bring up uh, depending on however and whenever you do it in your listing presentation. Um, so that's, that's what I do. By the way, I spend mm, 45 seconds on, on this piece of it and say, you know, please, please look at it at your leisure. And by the way, if I don't know the people, let me just back up here also. If I don't know the people, I sometimes bring the listing presentation to the first meeting and I leave it with them and say that I'll review more carefully when I'm with you, but I don't give them the comps that I'll use to assess the value of their property. All right, so we can go past that. The next thing is just an article that was in Top Agent Magazine. Trust me, I paid for this. They don't need to know that. Um, it just talks a little bit about my, my values in selling real estate. So we can go past that. The next piece, I, I do spend uh, some quality time on my marketing commitment. And this is what I've honed in on based on my first meeting with them and what bells and whistles I'll pull out. And lately, in the last couple of weeks, I've gone on three listing appointments against uh, Compass agents. And Compass has a really strong um, social media um, uh, digital media presence. Um, so I need to pull all that out. Now, by the way, this is the listing appointment I'm going on this afternoon. So I'm actually not pulling out all the bells and whistles on this one, but I'm pulling out some. So first I'll talk about that. I would generally do open houses, brokers, open houses, public open houses, but that because of COVID we're doing individual appointments. We're doing, um, I'll go in and show a property via, via FaceTime or Zoom. I'll do what it takes uh, to show the property. Most of my appointments I'm experiencing are private showings. And when I launch a new listing, I had a new list listing a couple of weeks ago, we had 33 showings. So I, you know, for days I was doing every 20 or 30 minutes. And um, so I would talk about that experience and how I would approach it with their property. Um, and that's only until uh, we get back to a normal place, but I don't see any, I, I don't think any of us think that we're gonna get to a normal place in the near future. Um, I also, at this point, uh, will bring up the possibility of uh, a virtual tour or a video of the property. I'm not, uh, I, I'm honestly not a huge fan of uh, virtual tours. I think they can really distort the property and uh, I'd rather do great photography and get a teaser uh, so that the people want to come and see the house. I think I'm more effective at selling a house if I can get the people into the property and tout all the features. And I, I think that kind of gets missed in a virtual tour. Um, I haven't, I don't know if I've even done, maybe I've done one so far. Okay, so then I jump into um, advertising. I do bring some of my marketing materials if I'm really trying to um, impress them and, and make sure I compete for the listing. For instance, the MLS Caravan, I have done full pagers in color. I've done double pagers in color for big properties. I always do a showcase ad. And by the way, none of this is that important anymore because we all look at it online and or not even look at the caravan. So that, that would be a case of um, throwing in the bells and whistles that I don't think are gonna sell the property, but might impress the, the seller when I'm competing against other people. I'll say that I'm gonna try to get their property um, in the LA Times Hot Properties. Uh, curbed LA, I've had some great properties that have been advertised in Cur Curbed LA. We don't have the ability to um, just put an ad in Curbed LA uh, for, for a feature property, but um, Aviva works with me as a great uh, way of getting us into Curbed LA or LA hot properties for, for really good properties. Um, we bring in a professional service to do a floor plan. 
I, I have a, what I think is a fantastic photographer. Um, he also does a video tour if, if we're going to do that. And uh, you guys have seen the video tours. They're just, uh, they're kind of like a mood of the property and um, for really good properties, that's a, a, a huge plus. Um, the video tours can be pricey. Um, so it just depends on, I'd rather not do them because of the, the cost. But again, if I'm, you know, trying to wow uh, the people at the listing appointment, I'm going to bring out more stops than I would normally bring out. Um, we talk about the internet and, and our presence in social media. And so uh, we'll always have a property website. They can go to my personal website. I always emphasize that um, everything in, that we do on social media is up to date seven days a week. Everything on the MLS is up to date. I oftentimes see, um, especially when we were doing uh, uh, open houses, uh, you know, first of, first showing on Sunday, uh, March third, and it's and it's uh, June, and people haven't updated them. So I always try to make sure that I let people know that we're always up to date, and I always give examples of other agents not being up to date. Um, we talk about the MLS linking to every other website that sells real estate. Redfin and Trulia and um, Realtor.com and all the other websites. I think there's over 400 websites now that link into the MLS. Uh, we talk about social media and all the things that we do for social media um, and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and uh, our core group blog and, and if there's any other social media platforms that are pertinent at the time. Um, Aviv, who works with me, does all of these things for me. So, you know, I, Obviously, I've been doing this a long time. I have an advantage of having someone uh, that does all these things for me. Um, and then we do a property video, a YouTube video. Um, and so that's the gist of it on social, on social media, digital media. Then other, other advertising vehicles we talk about. And um, we do a flyer that goes out to everyone. Um, if we're going to do a coming soon launch, I might talk about Top Agent Network that will put it out on on, uh, on that website. Uh, I talk about my um, rapport with top agents um, in the community, especially if I'm in my own backyard. Um, so that is, I spend probably more time on this portion of the presentation than anything else, even more so than than looking at the comps. Any thoughts, questions? Something I should do better. You could always, by the way, I, I go to these presentations of other agents too because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And, and I always know that other people are doing it better than I am. And I always find every presentation I go to, every seminar, I go to Steve Scholl things and Ed has great things uh, that he, he uh, throws out there. You always get something new and different. And, you know, I, I, I'm an old guy who's been doing this a long time. Social media is not my thing. Um, so love to hear anyone else's thoughts on this. Hey, Pete, uh, it's Joey. When you say, uh, vir what, what, do you, what does a virtual tour mean to you? Like when you said, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of the virtual tour. What, what is it, uh, are you talking about a Matterport? Are you yeah. talking about a walkthrough? Yeah. What is it? What, Where you what actually, is it that you are? Um, you're walking through the house. You're turning all the different ways, and and you're going up the stairs and down the stairs and into bedrooms and out to the backyard. Um, I, look, I, the reason I don't like it is because I think people might make a decision right then and there as to whether or not they want to see the house, and they may not be they may not be seeing the opportunities if it's not perfect for them. And because so many people are just coming to private showings, I personally would rather do that and give them less than more information to get them in the house. Um, so that's just, that's kind of what I'm feeling. And I'm not, I may be wrong. Yeah, and, and I, no, no, it's, there's no, I just wanted to know exactly what you, you know, 
what, what you know, they, may, they may they may think a bedroom looks too small right. and just say oh, I'm not right. going to go see it when the bedroom isn't too small but but you know they they get in the wrong position in the in the room and the in the walkthrough and and so it, look especially if it's a good house I don't want them to make a decision online I want them to come and see the house I mean makes sense so you want to give them enough information to you know stimulate the uh, the call to see it yes exactly all right the next page we'll, and we'll go through this much more quickly now the next page Ed, <laughs> is uh, a floor plan I, I give them a, an example of a floor plan i always do a floor plan uh, people love to you know <clears throat> take this look at measurements and all especially if they're seeing multiple properties in a given day uh, the next four pages and we can just fly through these but these are just examples of uh, my branded marketing and uh, other things that we've already talked about in the commitment. All right, and uh, you can fly through this. Okay, so then the property. Okay. Now, I, again, I don't, I don't want people to get too uh, caught up in looking at all these details. So I try to take command of, of this part of the, the meeting and say that, and by the way, I always, I, and by the, I should have, this should be, especially now with COVID, I should have this on digital media where if someone is pulling up this listings presentation, they could click on the MLS number and drill down to the property details. I, I don't, this is a PDF file and I need to, I realized as I was getting ready for this meeting today, I should be much more advanced on this. And uh, uh, you know, this, this, should be, uh, this should be actually, what I do is I, I send an email to myself with all these comps and then after the meeting, I send them the comps. I don't want them to see them before and I don't want them to spend time on it during the presentation. But is there a way that this could be interactive? Does anyone know, Ed? Yeah, Ed? yeah absolutely. Uh, you, you could, so you could create a PDF and these, uh, whoops, hold on. <laughs> Stop, don't move anything. Um, the, the, the address is there. You could make it so that those are clickable and they would go to whatever URL you want. You could either have it go to an MLS listing of the property, or you could have it go to your website where those properties are listed if you, if you have them on your website as well. Um, but yeah, that, that is entirely possible to have it so that those, so that for each one of these properties, you have a link for more information. Okay. Yeah, so I need, I need to uh, sharpen the saw on that and, and be able to do that, especially with COVID where some people would rather do the formal presentation over, over uh, this methodology. All right, so, so this, is, this is probably the meat and potatoes of how I determine my comps. Now, based on the meeting that I had with them and what factors they've given me in terms of what they think their home is worth, I'm gonna strategically apply comps that uh, will bring me in at the number that I think the property is worth. Um, if, if I go on a listing presentation and I, and by the way, I probably know what the property is worth when I'm uh, doing that first and formal walkthrough, but let's say for argument's sake, um, and on this one, I think it's worth a million seven fifty ish And by the way, this is a property, 607 North Mansfield that we're prepping right now that we're gonna launch uh, in the first week of August. That we're painting it, we're staging it, and, and we're gonna do all the bells and whistles. Um, and she wants a virtu uh, she wants a, vir uh, a virtual tour. Um, if she said to me in the meeting in the walkthrough, I think it's worth two million dollars, then I'm probably going to really finesse and make sure that comps that I pull up that were only sold for a million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, I will show her nicer than her property. Or vice versa, if you know someone says to me, "Yeah, I, I think it's worth one seven, but I think it could actually get one eight, then I'm going to 
uh, show her examples of pricing at one seven for a prop properties that, that uh, had multiple offers and sold in the first week and drove up the price. So it's always based on the information I have, I'm always gonna, gonna sh share with them candidly what I think the property is worth, but I might manipulate the comps that I use to the benefit of my argument. Uh, so in this particular instance, and this was done, uh, this was done in April. Um, so I might have better comps now, but uh, you know, the active listings, the pending listings, the just sold listings in my backyard, I probably in Hancock Park, if I'm going on a listing presentation, I've seen in the past before COVID, just about every property that went on the market, I, I, I make a concerted effort to really know the inventory. Um, if I'm going on a listing presentation and when I was newer to the business, if I couldn't see every property I, and I had more time, I take the time to drive the properties and at least know uh, what was going on with them from the outside. And lots of times, and I'm sure a lot of you would agree, you don't have to go in the house to really uh, kind of get a good idea of what the house is like. If someone's landscaping is beautiful, probably the house is, is somewhat like that inside. If they're not taking care of the outside, then probably aren't taking care of the inside. If they have um, expensive windows, you know, and beautiful uh, condition windows, they probably take care of their house. If they have really uh, shitty windows and a terrible door, then they're probably uh, not upgrading materially the inside. So I don't know. I get a lot of, I get a lot of grief from that. And um, so I think it's important to be able to talk formally about each comp. Now my sheet, this is the sheet that I'm giving them. My sheet has this, there's 12 properties here. At the bottom of the, in the, in the space down there, I have every property and notes that I wanna make on every property. Um, and I've studied the properties, I've studied the comps, and I don't wanna get caught with my pants down. If they know the comps and they've seen them, a lot of people, uh, you know, when, when we could go to open houses, saw the interiors, a lot of the properties, and they're making their own comparisons. Um, so I better be equipped and sharp in terms of being able to talk about each property. And what I also do uh, for my own is I rank every property. And so I'll have a one through 10, uh, 10 being the best. And so if I see uh, a property that was renovated in the 90s, that's probably not gonna get much more than a five from me. If we see a property that looks like it's been rated, renovated in the last 10 years, that's a seven or, or, or a plus for me. And if I see something that's really just been recently redone, I'm gonna give it more stars. And so um, I'm using that as I figure out what the price of this property is gonna be. I focus a lot on price per square foot. It's not the end all. Um, you can't compare uh, a property that is uh, got a 10,000 square foot lot with a property that's uh, got a 5,000 square foot lot. And you have to adjust accordingly for that. Okay, the next page, and the next pages that I haven't included here, I, I, I put client details uh, in the listing presentation. Hey Pete, so, so at this point, do you go through, do you walk them through uh, the, the comps one by one? And then my question is, do you go in any particular order, best to worst, worst to best? Um, I will not go through each of these uh, individually. I'll let them know that uh, uh, a couple of these properties might be the best comparisons to their property. And, uh, and so when, uh, what, I'll, what I'll key into is the selling price per square foot. In this case, you know, is it, there were lows in the 500s 600s, they get up into the eights, uh, but the eights are the outliers. And in this case, 700-ish is probably where I see uh, the subject property coming in. And so I'll have this, I'll be having this dialogue with them and, and not going uh, specifics other than maybe a, a 
two or three properties that I want them to focus in on um, and say those are those are the best like for like properties. And the and the two or three that you that you hone in on, do you show are those are those coming up? Is that what we got to look at? Yeah, well, I, I would I would have I would have each individual client detail. You don't have it in this package because I wasn't going to go through it today. So yeah. I'm just pointing out that I would have the 12 uh, properties. Here's my listing presentation, and and I would have um, the the client details for each one. But I'm really not spending a lot of time on this. Um, I'll say that to them that I'll email them, but here's where I think we need to be. And, um, and not go too detailed on this. Again, I'm, I'm 30 to 45 minutes. I'm trying to take control of the meeting. Um, if they challenge me a little bit, I'll be ready with my notes. Um, some people, they're just comfortable wanting to hear what you think the house is worth. And they really don't care about, I have so many people, they don't want to look at any of that. What do you think my house is worth? Just get cut to the chase. Let's get, get on with it. And so anyway, the last page of my presentation, uh, and this wouldn't be, the, the bottom here would not be circled. But in this particular instance, I've got a 2,400 square foot house. I'm looking at it on a price per square foot basis of, uh, what the house itself would be worth. And then this family recently tore down the garage, built a 400 square foot garage with a permitted guest house above. And so I gave a little added value for the guest house. And so for the main house, I kind of thought the $700 a square foot was right in the ballpark. And so that's a million six seventy five, and then if I added another hundred and twenty thousand uh, for the guest house, I this house, I think this house could sell in the one seven fifty to one eight range, and so I, this little this little exercise that I do, I steer this analysis to be right. I give you I give a range, and I want to be right in the middle. That's where I really ultimately want to price it. And in this case, so I'm saying, keep it under 1A. If I can get this person, we haven't pulled the trigger on the price yet. If I can get this person to go 1699, 1695, um, if it were today, I'm pretty sure that would go on multiple offers and we might get to a million seven fifty million eight. If, if, all the, uh, if, if all the stars align, we might even get over, over 1A. Um, it's over in the Hancock Park vicinity. It's off of Highland on Melrose below, um, uh, off of Highland below Melrose in the 600 block, not the best block over in that pocket. And I will explain that too. Uh, why can't, she sent me, a, the woman sent me a comp the other day that was $850 a square foot um, over on Citrus. Number one, Citrus is, is a much better street, better location. And it was a completely contemporary house. And this is a house that has, hasn't been upgraded since the 90s. And um, so I'm pretty honest. And I said to the owner, I said, look, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very, very different client. That's a very contemporary, modern house. Um, that person who's going to buy that house isn't, isn't going to be the person that buys your house. Um, and that person will pay more on a price per square foot basis. And she quickly said to me, I see your point. Okay, um, I, I, I agree with you. Um, that is my listing presentation. And um, sometimes they say they'll call me the next day. Sometimes they say, when can we start? I also have a generic calendar that I bring with me. And if, if during that appointment I get, I get the listing, then we will... Um, we'll start penciling in a time and action calendar at that point. And, um, and by the way, when I, in that first appointment, I'll, I'll assess what work needs to be done. In the case of Mansfield, the example we're looking at, um, she was moving, she is moving to Israel. And I was able to convince her that selling the house a month later after she moved out after we painted, after we staged, uh, 
would cost her $20,000 and get her at least another $50,000 on the price of the property. And she went with that. Not everyone's going to go with that. I've had people that won't budge. I've had people that will at least get a, let us bring a stager in to help them rearrange their house. Um, I've had people that have been willing to empty out their house, put it in storage and, um, and stage the house even while they're living there. We've, we've gotten stagers to, to allow that. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Staging will reap rewards beyond what it will cost them to stage. And uh, not everyone has that luxury of going and buying their new house or, or going and moving out. I have another one coming up on uh, Lillian Way and um, they are going to go move into a temporary rental. We're gonna paint it, stage it. Um, and then uh, if things go well, they're gonna stay in that rental until they find the house that they wanna buy next. But they can't afford to, uh, they can't afford to buy before they sell. Most people can't, but they can't afford to rent for a couple of months. So they were very cooperative in doing something like that and in realizing that they'll reap the rewards of spending a little bit of money to make more money. Pete, uh, I, I wanted to ask, I, I believe if I heard you correctly, you mentioned a, a listing presentation today for a place in uh, Santa Monica. And I, I know that you uh, are, have been very open in the past to partnering with, uh, with, with maybe an agent that's more of a local expert. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about. Yeah, all right, so I'll give you an example. And by the way, that was, I think that was the, that address was on my listing and commitment. So if one of you guys try to steal that listing from me, I'll come after you. But anyway, that is, this is this is freakish, but I have a client that has been a great client of mine for, for one of the first houses I sold. He has a brother that's a billionaire and his brother bought this property on the sand in Santa Monica for $12 million and just decided he doesn't want it. Just bought it and he just doesn't want it. So he wants to sell it. And I know that I'm, no pun intended, in, on the beach, but I'm a fish out of water. And I realized that I'm only going in there with the trust of my client telling his brother that you got to meet Pete, but I'm no fool. And this guy, I've seen some history of some of his real estate, and he's working with the, you know, the who's who in Beverly Hills. I've been told not to bring another agent into the equation yet, but I'm going to uh, look at Santa Monica and look at, right after I finish this meeting, I'm working on that, and I'm gonna work on who are the $10 million plus uh, sales in, in the last year, who are the agents who sold those? And I'm gonna have a couple of people in my back pocket that I'm gonna quickly and I've already volunteered it to my client, but I haven't volunteered it to uh, this person. I'm going to bring that up, Tim, and, and say, look, I think it would behoove you and me for me to co-list this. And here are a couple of people that I have in mind. Because uh, my, my attitude, you guys have heard me, and I know Tim's heard me say this, half of something is better than all of nothing. And can I, can I, would I be happy, thrilled? with a, a portion of a $12 million listing, you better believe it. And, um, but, but I'll also tell you, he, over, he, he paid too much for the property. And, um, and I know that if, if he only sells it for 10 million, he'll be okay with that. He just wants to sell the property. So Pete, in that situation, then the reason for them retaining you and not just going 100% with this agent who does all this business in Santa Monica would be because of the relationship with you? Exactly. Exactly. I've probably done 15 transactions with this guy through the years. Um, and, and so he trusts me implicitly. He and his brother are very close. And, so, and, and he, he said, Pete's the only guy I trust in this business. I know a lot of real estate agents. And of course, there's plenty of people that can be trusted all of you that are on this call. 
but I've got an advocate. I've got my, my best advocate in real estate rooting for me and pitching for me. And I even said to him, uh, Jason, I'm going to bring someone else in. He said, just meet with my brother and, and then you can bring that up as a possibility. I don't think it's necessary as long as you have it in you to drive the 20, 25 minutes down to show the property. And I'll do, I'll do it, but I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to short sight him and I don't want to short sight myself. Pete, all things equal, would you look for to partner with somebody that's Keller Williams agent? Yeah, with Joey on the call, you bet your ass I would. <laughs> um, but look, I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, selfishly and for the client make sure I'm, I'm picking a best agent. And, and one property that sold just a couple doors down for top dollar uh, was a, a particular agent. And I have him on my back pocket because I don't know if my client knows that. And so he may already very well be thinking about this other person. And so for me to say uh, so-and-so, and, and, and you know, it's Charles Pence. He's a great, great, uh, big agent, high-end agent down there who I've, I've been on mastermind groups with through the many years. Tammy Pardee is, you know, she and I have done business together. So, and I'm not sure that Tammy's the right person, but Charles, having sold one of the top sales on that little stretch of beach just in the last year, um, I could bring him into the equation and that would be a perfect match for me and for the client. Uh, Pete, I have a question. So uh, for the guest house, um, if uh, the property that you are looking to present um, has a guest house, but uh, there are no comparison comps that you could find in the neighborhood uh, that has a guest house. How would you value uh, that guest house uh, when you do the comp in that case? Yeah, uh, th I mean, that's, that's tricky because now we also have uh, permitted ADUs versus bootlegged guest houses. And um, it's got to add some value uh, having a guest house is it versus that is that permitted um or is it a garage it, conversion it it it's uh it's a garage conversion but the house has say the house has unpermitted additions as well that's 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 tough unpermitted main house additions is tough um and, and by the way, that's a material disclosure. And I would actually even include that in the private remarks uh, on the MLS listing. Um, and you, you have to be careful with that uh, legally not to get caught on that. But um, some people pay extra uh, for unpermitted spaces attached to the house. I find that uh, garage conversions, people pay a little bit more, but like for instance, if I'm in Largemont Village, in the small bungalow houses, half of them already have garage conversions. So it, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of an inherently factored into if, it, if it's a 1500 square foot house with a bootlegged garage that may get a premium. Well, a lot of houses have sold for a premium for 1500 square feet because they have the, the bootlegged conversion. So it's, it's in that. If there's nothing there, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure how I, would, how I would value that. Um, I do the best. Yeah, it's a, it's a fractional, so fractional valuation at best. Yeah, I agree. Not, not, a, not a slam dunk, not a, not, you know, some of these things aren't statistically driven. I love to do, do them statistically, but a lot of times they're just not statistical. And, and I'll tell you what, in this market, underpricing is still the way to go. And whenever I can underprice the price for multiples, I'm all for it. And if I can bring examples with my comps that show, and by the way, that's when I, in that detailed sheet, the first uh, portion of all the details of each property, it also has how many days on market and the original list price, the list price and the selling price. And if I can show examples 
of hot properties that were listed at a million six fifty that sold for a million eight, then I'm going to point those out too in terms of my pricing strategy. And I guess I didn't. Uh, I know I didn't go over the pricing strategy. That's also when I get to this last sheet. It's three different ways to price. Let's price it uh, fly off the shelf, almost auction pricing. If we're at a, if we're at um, where we think the market is, let's pr we can price it there. Or if you're looking for the needle in the haystack, we can price it at the very very high end of market. But know that that's the needle in the haystack. And if you don't get it in the first couple of weeks, we're, we have to have a serious conversation about the price and about uh, a soon to be announced price reduction. Um, and you got to, yeah, you, you, there's everything still going in multiples if it's priced right in the lower price ranges. The higher price ranges, I think it might be a different story. I didn't necessarily answer your question, Marissa, but it's a, that's a tough one. Happy to look at the property with you privately, hear you my thoughts. Pete, do you feel like in the higher price ranges that you have to be a little bit more on point as to sale price versus pricing under just because of the fewer eyeballs? Yeah, I yes, Charlotte. I, I think that's important right now because I, I don't think I, I do not think you can price um, uh, big estate properties for multiple offers. That's not happening. That that audience is, is much, much thinner and more selective. We have one coming up in uh, Nottingham and Los Feliz uh, in September, and it's gonna be at, at eight. We've already, we've already priced it, I mean, we'll, we'll finalize it, but um, you, you know, that's on the high, high end of the range. And I think on the high end, you have to, you have to go on that higher range um, and know that you know those, those people are in a different different category and they're more sophisticated, and they want to negotiate a little bit. You have to have a little a little um, a little wiggle room there. I think just depends. On, I, I'm sure it depends on the property too. Can I ask? And you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But the one that you had on Rimpaw felt very high to me. I realize it was new construction, but being on Third Street, that price point felt extremely high to me. But you did go into contract on it very quickly. Um, where, what was the thinking behind that? And if you can say where you ended up on it, that would be fabulous. If you can, I get it. Yeah, I, I, sh I can't talk about the price right now because we're still in the contingency period and we need to get past that. Um, you know, look, I looked at the comps on that. That's a very, very special house architectural, it's 2017 new construction, it's high end, it had everything going for it on a cul-de-sac overlooking the golf course, except that it had, and the big except is it had Third Street running down the back of the property. And um, so we priced it much higher than was my preference. We were definitely pricing it uh, for the needle in the haystack. Uh, we um, were all collectively the sellers, Star and myself, uh, on the same page in terms of our discussions about the price. Um, so we threw it all on the table and we were candid about it. And, and then we got someone that uh, loved, loved the house, was willing to pay a bit more of a premium probably than other people might pay. And, uh, and I think we got a really respectable number and, and um, hopefully you'll see it close and then you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but I can't disclose it. Why this comp if you get anywhere near it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll see. It's for, because, because we did our star and I did some magic. Uh, apparently. Yes. Do you, may I ask, do you feel like it was, did you feel like you got lucky on it or did you, were you just really working? Uh, we had we had um, three. We had two other people circling, but no one that was going to pay that price. And um, we got a we got the needle in the haystack. I'd say. Yeah. Thank you. Hey Pete, you got a, you got a few questions coming in here on the chat bar. Uh, Carlos is asking uh, when you go in for a listing presentation. 
do you fly solo? Um, uh, n not always, not always. I've been doing this 20 years, but I still don't always fly solo. If I'm going up against other, let's say if I'm going up uh, out to Encino, Jason Wolf, the, the guy I just talked about, he lives, lived in Encino. I, early on, I did a couple of uh, deals uh, with him, with other agents. This guy buys and sells properties every couple of years and, and income properties and all kinds of stuff. But um, then he had a, a property in Amistoy Estates, a big property. And I said, do you want me to team up with anyone? He said, hell no, we're, we're way past that. But I still offered it. And, you know, for me to drive out to Encino every time I'm going to show the property is a pain in the neck and I'm sometimes a little bit too busy, but, but he's a very great client. I would drop everything for him. And so I, I went solo on it. But if someone called me that I didn't know in Encino, Woodland Hills, uh, Calabasas, I'm more likely to, to bring in someone who collects with me out there, someone who's a local expert. Because again, I want the listing. Half of something's better than all or nothing. Uh, you've got another question too. Uh, Gene and David are asking, how do you determine where to start with your price per square foot? And then on that same note, Jenny Turkson's asking, what distance from the subject property and how far back do you go for comps? So all kind of related on where oh, yeah. to start. Yeah, so, so uh, look, on the price per square foot, it, it just, it, it, I have to look at the comps uh, or know the comps to really get a gauge on where I think the price per square foot should be. And if I have a pretty good sense of through the comps, what I, what I should be pricing the property at, then I'm going to guide my comps and this little analysis that's up on the screen to steer towards where I think it should be priced. And um, so, the, you know, look, a lot more experience goes into, uh, into that part of it. Um, and do I have the leadership position in the listing appointment? Are they looking to me to guide them? Are they, you know, know-it-alls and think they know everything and they're going to tell me? Um, you know, it just depends. It just depends. And it depends on if it's worth taking a listing. By the way, I'll walk away from a listing if, if, they, if this woman said to me, I, I want to price the house at 2250 I would say quickly, uh, with all due respect, I think that's too high. I'm not the right agent for you on that house. But I'll tell you what, if you have another agent who's taking that listing and they fa fail, I, I'm going to suggest to you that you put in the listing contract that you can terminate that listing. And if, if they fail, let me come in and, and sell the property for you at the right price. And I've gotten listings that way on the rebound. Um, so I'll do that. Uh, the second part of the question is how far out do I go on comps? I'm going to try to keep it really on a, on a small circle uh, within an area. Look, if I'm, if I'm in Hancock Park and it's an expensive property, um, I'm going to just go down below third to Wilshire and from Van Ness over to Highland. That's, that's it. I'm not going any farther. Or maybe, I'll, maybe I'll look at the pocket north of Beverly over between Highland and the golf course. If I'm going in, in a smaller house up on Largemont Village, um, I'm specifically keying into Largemont Village. I'm not going uh, farther north into Hollywood. I'm not going below Beverly because that's a different neighborhood. That's Windsor Square. And even if it's the same size house, it's going to sell for more below Beverly and Windsor Square closer to the village. Um, if I really have an unusual house, then I may have to go farther out to try to find comps. Um, and just when I, like when I was giving you my stats earlier today and I, I pulled in Los Feliz, uh, by the way, I consider Los Feliz and Hancock Park, the big properties to sell for about the same price. So if I had to, I might be a little more creative, but only because I have to, not because it's, it's the way to do it. I think we've got one more a question. I think it's pretty good here. What about getting it permitted before the sale and <clears throat> yeah, Marissa I'll, I'll also add a, what about doing a pre-home inspection as well? Uh, you know, pre-home inspections, there's no right or wrong on that because, um, I mean, that could, 
that could bite you in the ass too, because if you do pre <laughs> inspection and there's a lot of things that come up, then, then the buyer in their investigation might go crazy and bring in 15 inspectors versus if they don't have the report and no one knows anything, they might bring in an inspector who's a little more cavalier about, ah, that's not a big deal. You get that fixed after closing. And, and so I, I'm, I guess it depends and I'd be open to it, but I'm not a fan of doing it necessarily. By the way, as an example, you get a second opinion on termite, that will bite you in the rear. That, that, that second termite company will always find more things than the first termite company came up with. It's probably the same thing with, with inspections. If you have a problem that like a chimney and you know there's gonna be a problem, I, I've done chimney inspections before and given the report out and said, no, no credit towards the chimney. Something like that I've done. Yeah. And, and about getting stuff, uh, work permitted before the sale? Okay. Um, that's a big, big undertaking. And uh, that could take months. And uh, I think it would add value. Um, so I think that it might be worth it. But I would, I would proceed as the agent giving advice uh, that you have to throw caution into the equation because what happens if um, that unpermitted space, the city inspector says, tear it out. Next thing you know, Keller Williams and the agents getting sued because we suggested that you brought uh, the building inspector in to get that permitted. And that could very, very well happen. At any point, do you actually uh, administrate that process, Pete? Hell no. <laughs> uh, it was I, a trick uh, question. That, that, that was a soft, that <laughs> I was knew a you were going to say hell no. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. yeah. Well, you're, you know, you're, you, you, you have to be really careful. It's not, how it's not your job. Yeah. yeah, it's not our job. And, yeah. and you could open up a can of worms by, and it's not, and, and, and to even suggest doing it, um, I, I would be really careful. Now I've had instances where things were permitted at its square footage and there was a C of O, but it never made it to the public records. Uh, that's different because I'd love to see it in the public records. And by the way, the Nottingham property I'm giving the example of, he had the, the permit, the C of O, and it was 500 extra square feet that never got added in. Um, I, I said to him, it would be nice for that to be added to the public square footage uh, before he lists the property. He went down to the city, showed them the documentation, they changed it in the public records and corrected it. There's a lot of that that goes yeah. on in the city, not correct. Yeah, that. even if, yeah, even if you have all the permits and to back you up and the, the sign off and the completion and, and you just haven't gotten the C of O, it's always like a lingering question, yeah. right? And that's where, yeah. and, and it's always like a ding. Yes, absolutely. And by the way, if you aren't sure, do not proceed in giving direction without getting direction from Joey, from John Davidson. John, you know, those guys are, are uh, great resources or are, are calling our attorney. If there's anything that I'm un uncomfortable with, I'm reaching out to Joey, John Davidson, and, and, and they may direct me to go to, to, to our attorney and, and I'm putting in writing. I'm, I'm covering my rear. How do you feel, Pete, about properties that have unpermitted square footage, but the seller wants to, that square footage to be on the listing? Do you well, I'm at, uh, that's, you know, that's okay as long as you're letting them know that that's a material disclosure. I'm not doing it without them acknowledging that it's a material disclosure, that they have to disclose that. I'm not putting myself in a vulnerable position. I'm not putting my real estate license at risk uh, for to sell a property. And, uh, and then I'm putting in the private remarks on the MLS saying that they're, you know, I might, I might, you know, you know, that whole thing that people put in that the square footage may not accurately reflect and it's up to the buyer to do their own investigation, but I, I'm going to disclose that. And I wanted to ask a question about COVID, um, which I think 
you know, you've been around, especially in this area, long enough that you may have actually set foot in almost all houses in the neighborhood. But for those of us who haven't, who've been somewhat constricted by uh, lack of brokers opens and really not seeing the pumps of the last four months, I mean, how do you, are you handling it or how do you suggest? You yeah, know, that's, kind of that's uh, you do the best you can right now. It's, it's, um, it's not as easy to do comps right now. Um, especially when you're in your backyard where you think you're the expert because you haven't seen them. You know, you can get a pretty good idea um, from, from photos, uh, but not really nailing it. Uh, um, uh, that one on McCadden, uh, for, what was it, 480 North McCadden that just... Uh, Jim and JR's house at 420. Wow, 420. Okay, so I look at this property. I showed it. I looked at this property, and it's only 3,500 square feet plus a guest house uh, for $5 million. And I'm like... But that's Andrew. That's the nature of Andrew. That's the nature of the listing agent. And they... Yeah. Just so well, you know, they're, they're Santa Barbara. They're friends, actually. They're Santa okay. Barbara. Well, this... This was about as spectacular as they get. And I walked in there, my clients were like, this is unbelievable, it's perfect. And, and they didn't write an offer, but I heard that that went for five, five. So, so you'd never be able to comp that um, with comps in the neighborhood. Like William Hefner's house was like that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By the way, knowing the comps, I mean, uh, I know all these properties and, and William Hefner's house uh, goes in, you know, they, they report that it's 5,000 square feet, but he had a 1,000 square foot guest house uh, conversion and garage conversion. And that they advertise 5,000 square feet. That's 4,000 square feet that sells for over $6 million. There's no comps for that. So that's a subjective evaluation. One that really threw me, and I'm curious what your take on it was, and, and I'm sorry if this is, if you, the rest of you, I know Tim is interested in this as well, but um, the one on the corner, uh, Beverly and June, right across the street from me, that was a, it's a nice house, and they did a lot of, they died, but 3,200 square feet on Beverly Boulevard, Beverly. and they sold it for 36, 8, 3.6. Okay. Let's, let's yeah, unbelievable. unbelievable. When the bus stop stops there, when the bus stop, bus takes off, it roars there. It, it I, I didn't see the house this time. I saw the house last time. It's got two master suites. It's not even a, it's not a family house. Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, do you have any explanation for that? She had five offers on that. I know, crazy. Uh, yeah, I know. But anyway, that, but by the way, that, guys, this is a good example of, really knowing cops and knowing everything in your backyard. And so, you know, I didn't get to see that one this time, but I've seen it in the past and, and uh, you know, Charlotte lives right in that neighborhood and is, is paying particular attention over there. And everyone should be doing that in the areas that they farm or, or, or if it's in your backyard where you live, um, it's really important to know everything that's going on. I, I keep an eye on, everything in area 18 carefully even if i don't have buyers for it um, because it's always a talking point it's a talking point uh, when you're out with your friends at a party everyone talks real estate and um I, all right i'm going to say one more thing and then I, and then i know we've we spent an hour over an hour okay last quick thing um so uh when people used to say to me Oh, how's real estate? I would always say, oh, it's fantastic. I'm doing well and blah, blah, blah. They don't care about you. They care, here's my experience. People care about what's going on for them. And uh, so I started carrying a little something in my back pocket. Uh, I worked with Steve Scholl in the past and it, it was, it was he'd always call it a proportunity. And so when people said, hey, Pete, how's real estate? I would quickly say, oh man, I just saw the greatest property. Um, and it's such and such property, it's such and such the address. And it was one of the nicest properties I've seen recently, or it could be a condo, or I just saw this 10 unit building. And you would be shocked at the, the, 
way the conversation goes differently than if I said, oh yeah, I'm really busy, real estate's great. It's like, oh yeah, well, good, good for you, big deal. But start talking about a specific property or specific rates for financing or something else that's really uh, valuable to them, there's a whole different dialogue about real estate and you, you show them that you're, you're an expert in the business too. Okay, so on that wow. note, it's been a while, we've been out of uh, <laughs> well, well, this is great. Uh, I'm sure uh, I've seen many people thank you on the chat bar here and they will all give a, a round of virtual applause to, to Pete for, for, uh, for teaching this wonderful last hour. Um, I know I certainly took down a bunch of notes and I can't wait to listen to it again. Um, so yeah, uh, some people asking, are we, did we record this? Yes, it's being recorded. So I will post this up on our YouTube channel so you can go and uh, listen to it again and uh, miss out, miss, catch up on any pieces that you may have missed out. But uh, again, thank you so much to Pete for, for teaching this wonderful class. It was, I, I know you're a busy guy, so we're really honored that you did this. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed doing it, guys. Thanks, Pete. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Excellent. Thanks, Pete. Have a great day. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. We'll see you soon.